All right, we are in uh, Daniel chapter 9 tonight. Daniel, his prophecy, prophecy of 70 years, 70 weeks, determined upon Jerusalem in Daniel chapter 9. Now, the beginning of this chapter, Daniel is praying, and in all reality, um, there's a prayer. I'm going to read the chapter quickly. It's not a super long chapter, um, but it's key to the entire book, and it's key, so key to prophecy, last day's prophecy, uh, completely. Daniel, through uh, verse 19, he's praying, and it's a remarkable prayer. This should not be skimmed over. It's not prophecy. The prophecy that's given, Gabriel appears to him again, and it's an answer to his prayer. You'll notice that. I'm laying this groundwork, so as you read it, we, we see you can see what I see, and, and hopefully you see as well. But Daniel's praying for Jerusalem, and he recognizes God. I mean, God is scattered, and God has allowed the desolation, and God, even Daniel's part of that, carried away and suffered. He does not curse God. He is not angry at God. And he believes that all of it is justified, and he's, it's, a, it's a real open and raw confession of sin. This text is, these first 19 verses. He's praying for Jerusalem. What's going to happen to Jerusalem? Are you going to show mercy to Jerusalem? And so the prophecy we get here tonight, Gabriel appears and says, you know, basically God's heard your prayer. This is what God has determined upon Jerusalem upon these last days. So let's read Daniel chapter 9, beginning in verse 1. And so remember again, we're backing up King Darius, right? In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, of the seed of the Medes, which was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of the years whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolation of Jerusalem. That is in Jeremiah chapter 25, verse 11 and 12. Jeremiah was a uh, somewhat contemporary uh, of Daniel, a little bit older. And Daniel obviously had access to his writings and Jeremiah wrote of this same prophetic time period. Daniel's telling us at the beginning of this that, that he had come to an understanding of this, and that's because of what Gabriel comes and says to him. Verse 3, And I set my face unto the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplications, listen, with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. And I prayed unto the Lord my God and made my confession and said, O Lord, the great and dreadful God, keeping the covenant and mercy to them that love him and to them that keep his commandments, we have sinned and have committed iniquity, and have done wickedly, and have rebelled, even by departing from thy precepts and from thy judgments. Neither have we hearkened unto thy servants, the prophets, which spake in thy name to our kings, our princes, and our fathers, and all the people of the land. O Lord, righteousness belongeth unto thee, but unto us confusion of faces, as at this day to the men of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and unto all Israel that are near and that are far off through all the countries whither thou hast driven them because of their trespass that they have trespassed against thee. O Lord, to us belongeth confusion of face to our kings, to our princes, and to our fathers because we have sinned against thee. So I want, you, I want to stop there because I know I don't have anything in my notes about this, so I'll say it now. And I read verse seven and eight together for a reason. Twice here he says, to us belongeth confusion of faces. And what's he talking about? He's just quoted, he's just referenced that he's come to understand Jeremiah's prophecy, right? In verse two. So he has Jeremiah in mind and he's just mentioned him. And if you remember, Jeremiah was given prophecy of judgment by God, harsh judgment as Daniel was as well. Jeremiah got, was worried about how the message would be received. I mean, you don't want to go and deliver a harsh message, right? Tell people that there's going to be death. There's going to be uh, scattered. They're going to lose battles. They're going to lose lives. And Jeremiah was balking some. And what God told him was to, to pay no attention to their faces. Now, when you deliver an unpopular message, we all want our message to be received. It's no different with the gospel. We wish that people were flocking into the church and walking down the aisles and breaking and crying their eyes out, and calling out for God and calling out for Jesus. People aren't doing that. They're seeking a lot of things today, but they're not seeking God. 
And so the prophets were told, be faithful, deliver the message. And they were actually told at times, basically, that very few people, if any, the nation's going to reject the message I'm giving to you. And so what Daniel says is God's ju just. God has all this wisdom. And God is righteous in what he's doing. And what belongs to us, he says, confusion of faces. He says it again in verse 8. Verse 9, to the Lord our God belong mercies and forgiveness, though we have rebelled against him. Neither have we obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in his laws, which he set before us by his servants, the prophets. Yea, all Israel have transgressed thy law, even by departing, that they might not obey thy voice. Therefore the curse is poured upon us, and the oath that is written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, because we have sinned against him. And he hath confirmed his words, which he spake against us and against our judges that judged us by bringing upon us a great evil for under the whole heaven hath not been done as hath been done upon Jerusalem. As it is written in the law of Moses, all this evil has come upon us. Yet made we not our prayer before the Lord, our God, that we might turn from our iniquities and understand thy truth. Boy, people haven't changed, have they? When we suffer, we get angry at God. We suffer, men shake their fist at God. People say, I quit going to church. I give up on God. My life was so tough. I don't deserve this. Daniel's saying, we have suffered unbelievably and we deserve it because of our sin. Verse 14, therefore hath the Lord watched upon the evil. He watched upon the evil and brought it upon us. For the Lord our God is righteous in all his works which he doeth. For we obeyed not his voice. And now, O Lord our God, that has brought thy people forth out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand and has gotten the renown as, as at this day we have sinned, we have done wickedly. O Lord, according to all thy righteousness, here he prays for Jerusalem, according to all thy righteousness, I beseech thee, let thine anger and thy fury be turned away from thy city, Jerusalem, thy holy mountain, because for our sins and for the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and thy people are become a reproach to all that are about us. Now, therefore, O our God, hear the prayer of thy servant and his supplication and cause thy face to shine upon thy sanctuary that is desolate for the Lord's sake. O my God, incline thine ear and hear, open thine eyes and behold our desolations and the city which is called by thy name. For we do not present our supplications before thee for our righteousness, but for thy great mercies, O Lord. O Lord, hear. O Lord, forgive. O Lord, hearken and do. Defer not for thine own sake, O my God, for thy city and thy people are called by thy name. Now I'm going to continue reading in just a second. We've only got, what, seven, eight verses left in the chapter. Do you see, we don't, let me tell you, we don't pray like this because our heart is not in the place that Daniel's was. Daniel had never even been, I mean, he had not been back to Jerusalem. He had been taken away as a youngster, likely most, if not all of his family killed. The people of God had suffered unbelievably. And he knew that it was not a defeat on God's part, but it was carried out by God in judgment. And Jerusalem was desolate in this fashion. And so he's here praying and he's making a confession of sins. And he'd been fasting. And he's sitting and mourning and he's in sackcloth and ashes. And he's laying out his prayer and his prayer is heard. Verse 20, he says, While I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of my God, yea, whilst I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation. And he informed me and talked with me and said, O Daniel, I am now come forth to give thee skill and understanding. At the beginning of thy supplications, the commandment came forth. And I am come to show thee, for thou art greatly beloved. Therefore, understand the matter and consider the vision. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. There's a lot there, but notice that it ends with to anoint the most holy. He's answering him concerning Jerusalem. How long, right? 70 weeks of prophecy are determined upon Jerusalem. 
70 prophetic weeks. Okay, and we're going to look at what those prophetic weeks are. And we can know that because of fulfillment of much of this already, has already happened. So he says in verse 25, Know therefore and understand that going, the, the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem from the time of that commandment unto the Messiah, the Prince, until the coming of Christ, we believe that to be Christ, shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. The street, uh, and that's 69 weeks. Now he just said 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and he's just revealed 69 weeks of prophecy, right? The time. We believe these prophetic weeks to be periods of seven years because that's exactly how it was fulfilled from the time of the command that we're going to talk about. I'll read the notes for it here in a minute. He says, the street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. We, we, we can read all about that in Nehemiah, about the building of the wall. What was the message my dad used to preach from there? Nehemiah was commanded to build the wall. They had, they had uh, tools for the mortar in one hand and a sword in the other. I mean, they were fighting as they built it. I can't remember. He used to preach a message, one of his iconic messages he preached from Nehemiah uh, about the building of that wall, but I don't remember the title. I'll remember it later. And after three score and two weeks shall be Messiah be cut off. And he's talking about the death of Christ. Gabriel is revealing this to him. But not for himself and the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city. He's prophesying the downfall uh, of uh, Jerusalem and of the temple. It'll be destroyed. We know by the Romans. And the sanctuary and the end thereof shall be with the flood and unto the end of the war now, through the end of the war, through the end of the 70 weeks, what he, all he says about this is that there will be desolations are determined. Now, this is a word we've seen all through the book of Daniel. We know that ultimately there's going to be one who stands in the holy place and it's referred to as the abomination that maketh desolate. Yet Daniel in his prayer talks about how Jerusalem has been desolated, desolated, and it has been. You think about it for the last 2,000 years, it's a city. But there is no temple. In all truth, the closest they can ascertain, there is a, a mosque sitting on that site where we believe that the, the, the last temple was, the holy temple site. There's a portion of the wall, just a portion. They refer to that today as the wailing wall. They go and they pray and they weep at the remnants of that wall that was destroyed by the Romans. But he says, uh, desolations are determined for an indeterminate period, for an unknown time. We're living in that time. He, and through that time, Jerusalem's been made desolate so many times. The Jewish people have been reviled, persecuted, killed, slaughtered, scattered around the world. He shall confirm the covenant. Now, here we're talking about, I believe, the man of sin. He shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. Once again, these prophetic weeks. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease and for the overspreading of abomination, the ultimate abomination, overspreading of abomination, he shall make it desolate even until the consummation and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. All right, so we see here, I'm gonna start in some of my notes. This is uh, the time of King Darius. So we've backed up again. The first year of Darius the Medes reign and Darius was set over uh, as king over these provinces by Cyrus the Persian, Cyrus the Great. After their, they had conquered the, ba uh, the Babylonians, the Chaldeans. I want to lay out that the number seven is a very significant number in prophecy. And I'm careful when I talk about numbers. <clears throat> because there's a lot of people out there that have went overboard on numbers. Because in all reality, a number is just a number, Right? So every time you see a number in the Bible, it's not necessarily significant. But there are times, particularly with prophecy, that they're very significant. They're even symbolic, okay? There are people that will not even look at the teachings of the Scripture, but will use numbers and try and determine Jesus is coming back, you know, in 37 minutes, that sort of thing. That's not what I'm talking about. But, to, but understand, before we go on, there is, there is, a, there, there is a, a very large significance with the number seven, particularly here in the, uh, in the book of Daniel and Daniel's prophecy. Well, we see that. Smith's Bible Dictionary says of this number seven, the frequent recurrence of certain numbers in the sacred literature of the Hebrews is obvious to the most even superficial reader. <clears throat> it is almost equally obvious that these numbers are associated with certain ideas 
uh, so as in some instances to lose their numerical force and to pass over into the province of symbolic sign. And uh, that's certainly the truth. There is more or less, uh, this is more or less true of the numbers 3, 4, 7, 12, and 40, but 7 so far surpasses the rest, both in the frequency with which it recurs and in the importance of the objects with which is, it associ is associated, that it may fairly be termed the representative sy symbolic number. Cons uh, it has attracted considerable attention and may be said to be the keystone on which the symbolism of biblical numbers depends. And here we have a prophecy of uh, 70 years or 70 weeks of prophecy and 70 years in desolation. So Daniel was praying, he prays and he confesses and considers Jeremiah's prophecy. And I think I have the reference to that here. Well, <clears throat> Jeremiah chapter 25, verses uh, 11 and 12. Let me back up a little bit first though, actually. Jeremiah 25, I'm gonna read several verses from Jeremiah chapter 25, because that's what he's, when this happens, this is what he's considering. He's wondering about this. <clears throat> they say Daniel was 15, 16 years old when he's taken captive. At that time, Jeremiah, based on his writings, is estimated to be about 36 years old. So he's about 20 years older. He was prophesying just shortly before Daniel. We know that Jeremiah's writings, they, uh, King Hezekiah would order them to be burned. But thank God, scribes obviously were making copies feverishly of these writings at that time, as they always did. And somehow Daniel had gotten a hold of those writings as a, with the position that he had. No doubt he had access to those things. But Jeremiah chapter 25, the word that came to Jeremiah concerning all the people of Judah in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, that was the first year of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. Jeremiah is in Egypt, not in Babylon. Verse 10, he says, Moreover, God speaking to Jeremiah, I will take from them the voice of mirth from Jerusalem and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom, the voice of the bride, the sound of the millstones and the light of the candle. And this whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment. And these nations shall, shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. I believe this is, I read earlier in my notes, this was uh, 20 or 40 years prior to it happening that he says this, that there'll be, uh, these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. And it shall come to pass when 70 years are accomplished that I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, saith the Lord, for their iniquity and the land of Chaldeans and will make it a, a, a perpetual desolations. And so Je Jeremiah foretold Babylon's success for a period of 70 years. He gave this prophecy in 605 B.C., the same year in which Nebuchadnezzar came to power. We, from verse 3, we learn that Jeremiah began his ministry in 627 B.C. by, by uh, just subtracting the years. He predicted this, uh, here it is, 70 years of captivity, a full 20 years before it began. As for the desolations of Israel, the city of Jerusalem was completely destroyed in 586 B.C. when the armies attacked the city for the third time. The 70 years were complete with the destruction of the Jewish temple. The Jewish temple was destroyed in 586, and though reconstruction was started in 536 B.C., the rebuilt temple was not completed until 516 B.C. That's exactly 70 years from the time it was sacked and destroyed, from the date of the desolation, exactly 70 years, fulfilling Jeremiah's prophecy, confirming Scripture. Now, I said I wanted to read from Schofield's notes. And I don't believe this is uh, boring, but it is from the Schofield Notes. And if you have a Schofield Bible, you can follow along. Because what this explains is these seven, the weeks, these prophetic weeks. It explains it very well, better than I can. And I believe I have this in my digital notes here, which I can see very much better. These are weeks, Schofield wrote, or more accurately, sevens of years. Seventy weeks of seven years each. Within these weeks, the national chastisement must be ended and the nation reestablished in everlasting righteousness. So that period, the, the, the total of that period would be 490 years. The 70 weeks are divided into seven, 49 uh, years, 62, uh, what do I have here in my notes? Verse, oh, in seven weeks or 49 years, Jerusalem was to be rebuilt in troublesome times. This was fulfilled as Ezra and Nehemiah record. I mentioned Nehemiah a little bit ago. 62 weeks, 434 years, thereafter Messiah was to come, according to here in Daniel 9, 25, that we just 
just read the, the three score and two weeks. That would be 434 years. This was fulfilled in the birth and manifestation of Christ. Now, the reason Schofield's laying this out is because right now I'm not talking about end time. I'm talking about prophet. This was given to Daniel, and then this was fulfilled in these time periods. And you can actually ascribe very close proximate dates to the uh, to these events and see that these prophetic weeks were obviously periods of seven years. Understanding that, then the 70th week of Daniel's prophecy, which we call the tribulation, the time of Jacob's trouble, it is obviously also not literally a week, seven days. It is also a period of seven years. And if in the middle of that week is when the Antichrist uh, breaks a, what we might call a treaty or an agreement and stands in the holy place, that would be three and a half years into that tribulation period. So 62 weeks, Messiah was to come, the prince. This was fulfilled in the birth of Christ. Daniel 9, 26 is obviously what we would call an indeterminate period. What I'm telling you is we've been living on borrowed time. 69 weeks of prophecy have been fulfilled. Uh, the date of the crucifixion is not fixed. In this indeterminate time, what Schofield says here is takes place the entire church age. The date of the crucifixion is not fixed. It is only said to be after the three score and two weeks. It is the first event in Daniel 9, 26. The second event is the destruction of the city fulfilled in AD 70. Then what Daniel says, he doesn't say that these will run consecutive. 69 weeks of this prophecy did run consecutive, 490 years. But now Daniel says, he uses kind of a vague term. He says, unto the end, unto the end. We don't know when that is. No man knows the day or the hour. A period which is not fixed but which has already lasted 2,000 years. To Daniel, it was only revealed that wars and desolations should continue. Do you realize that's exactly what Jesus said? I was reading this this morning. I thought about Matthew 24. And actually, Schofield, when he says this, to Daniel was revealed only that wars and desolations should continue. He references Matthew 24, 6 through 14. Now, Jesus gives the Mount Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24 and 25. And a lot of preachers, and many times when we read it, we try and apply it to the entirety of the world scene. It's about the last days. Jesus says, there will be wars and rumors of wars. And he's actually talking about Jerusalem. He's talking about the Mideast. He's talking about the focal point of the Mideast. He's talking about the nation of Israel. And so what, what Daniel says is confirmed in the words of Christ as well. And Daniel only knows that wars and desolations will, should continue. And boy, have they. It's still the focal point of violence in the world today. Sadly, the most debated piece of ground in the entire world. The New Testament reveals that which was hidden from the Old Testament prophets. We know a lot more about this period because we've been through a bunch of it and we're living in it now. So he says the New Testament reveals much of what was hidden that during this period should be accomplished the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, the outcalling of the church, the time of grace. Why has Jesus not come? Why has the tribulation period not started? You know, that was talked about and then in the, not only by Daniel, but by John in the Revelation, by the apostles in the New Testament, by Jesus himself. In, this, in that same sermon, Matthew 24 and 25, he says, Then shall be tribulation like this world has never seen before, nor ever will again. The only thing, the reason that hasn't happened is the determinate will of God, the determinate counsel of God and God's grace. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. We are living on borrowed time. And as sure as... 99% of Daniel's prophecy has been fulfilled and that of Jeremiah. So too will that that is yet to start. So he says when the church age will end and the 70th week of Daniel's prophecy will begin is nowhere revealed. But understand, I agree with this. It's very important. Its duration, the 70th week of Daniel, can be but seven years. To make it more violates the principle of interpretation already confirmed by all of this fulfillment. 
Daniel 9.27 deals with the last week, the last week of his prophecy. The he of Daniel 9.27 is the prince that shall come, whose people literally roam. We don't know what all that symbolizes. Destroyed the temple in AD 70. He, the he, is the same with the little horn of chapter 7. He will covenant with the Jews to restore their temple sacrifices for one week, seven years. But in the middle of that week, he himself will break the covenant and fulfill Daniel chapter 12, verse 11, and what Paul wrote to the Thessalonians about in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Between the 69th week, after which Messiah was cut off, crucified, and the 70th week, within which the little horn of Daniel 7 will run his awful course, intervenes this entire church age that we now live in. That was determined by God. We're not off course on God's prophetic plan. Daniel 9.27 deals with the last three and a half years of the seven, which are identical with the great tribulation. Matthew 24, it's called a time of great trouble. Daniel chapter 12, and verse one, it's called an hour of temptation. John in the Revelation calls it the tribulation. So did Jesus in the gospels. So near as to give a full warning, so indeterminate as to give no satisfaction to our curiosity. The 434 years reckon, of course, from the end of the seven weeks, so that the whole time from the going forth of the commandment to restore, and that's the starting, that is the, the key to the start of this prophecy, according to Gabriel, the going forth of the commandment to restore unto the Messiah is 69 weeks of years, or 483 years. Now, it's interesting here that they can establish that. The decrees concerning Jerusalem are recorded. He gives several decrees that could be considered and then tells us basically what it is. That of Cyrus, 536 BC, for the restoration of the house of the Lord God of Israel, found in 2 Chronicles. That of Darius, which is recorded in Ezekiel chapter 6. And that of Artaxerxes in his seventh year in Ezekiel 7:7. 7, 7 for the rebuilding of the city uh, of Jerusalem and fulfilled in the book of Nehemiah. The last decree, the latter decree, is obviously that from which the seven weeks run. In the present state of biblical chronology, the date of the decree of Artaxerxes cannot be exactly fixed farther than to say it was issued between 454 and 444 BC. In either case, we are brought right down to the time of Christ, right to the time of Christ. So the prophecy is fulfilled after the fact. The abominations, the expression occurs three times in Daniel. The abominations, Daniel chapter nine, chapter 12 here. The references to the beast or the man of sin, it's identical with Paul in 2 Thessalonians, the Lord in Matthew 24. Now what we read about in Daniel 11, uh, 31, uh, Schofield confirms what, we, what, we, what I've said. The references to the act of Antiochus Epiphanes, who he, what he calls him is this, the prototype of the man of sin, who sacrificed a sow upon the altar and entered the Holy of Holies, a place that not even most Hebrews would, could go. I mean, the Holy, the Holy of Holies was a place that was only seen at the proper time by the, the high priest and all of the preparations that were involved, but Antiochus entered into the Holy of Holies. So we see this prophecy and now we look back at it with historical perspective. And we see that what Gabriel was telling Daniel hadn't happened yet, but it all came to pass. God cannot lie. His word is true. He keeps his promises. And so God's plan for mankind through the ages is revealed and it reaches its full fruition at the end of Daniel's 70th week of prophecy. And so we see, we see God dealing with the Hebrew people down through the ages. I've got another, what time is it? Yeah, we got a little bit of time. I'm gonna read something else, okay? Read a little bit of this and we'll see how far I get through it. God's prophetic clock. First, we are given the time period involved, 70 weeks or 70 periods of seven equaling 490. The word for week in Hebrew simply means seven. It's the same as the word seven and could be used for days or years. Numbers of seven. 
the celebration of uh, Jubilee, the same root word is used in Leviticus chapter 25, which is also seven periods of, uh, takes place in the 50th year after seven periods of seven years or four, 49 years. So it's not, not hard to understand why it, it is worded this way and is rendered the way it is in our English Bibles. So this sets the parameters around the clock. The time period is 490 years, and these years revolve around Daniel's people, Israel, the Jews, the holy city, Jerusalem. These are the events that will take place during this prophecy. To finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, <clears throat> to make rec reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, seal up the vision, and seal up the prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Seven things. Transgression and sin we know are as real today as they were in Daniel's day. War, murder, robbery, evil. A, a staple part of everyday life. It's a wicked world we live in. But we know that at the end of this, there will be an end of sins. Um, an everlasting righteousness ushered in. Now, more than 490 years have passed since Daniel penned these words. And also since the commandment was given. <clears throat> to restore Jerusalem and build a wall. I mean, Daniel penned these words 2,500 years ago, right? Why have they not been fulfilled? We've already spoken to that. We're living on borrowed time. There's this indeterminate period. How long, O oh Lord? The seven events of Daniel 9:24 speak <clears throat> of a future time from, that, from his perspective. And at the end of it, when the Messiah will reign on the earth, each of these events listed by Gabriel speaks specifically to the Messianic era. Many mistakenly apply this prophecy to the world. When Gabriel told Daniel it involved his people and his city, the Jews and Jerusalem are God's sign to the nations. By observing Jerusalem and the Jewish people, we can see and better understand God's prophetic clock. Now, the 490 years were cut or determined, but it literally means cut upon Jerusalem and the Jewish people. At the completion of the prophetic clock, the seven events will be completed on the Jews and Jerusalem and by proxy on the rest of the world. But they are key to the understanding of the time. These events will be completed. Now, how is this time cut or determined? Daniel was informed in the 24th verse that 490 years were divided upon his people and city. In verse 25, we're given a breakdown of this division in time. The prophetic clock established a 490 year time period composed of 70 units of seven years, totaling 490 years. <clears throat> Within this 490 years are specific points of division determined regarding specific events. These events allow us to establish or qualify the way he says it, the time involved. The angel Gabriel admonishes the reader to know therefore and understand and in hindsight, by looking at this, and it's a, it's a detailed study, it's a deep study, we can then do what he says, know therefore and understand. What must the reader understand? The reader must understand how the time is divided and where these divisions take place. <clears throat> We've established this already with some of Schofield's notes, so some of this is all good and it's in depth. First, there is a starting point <clears throat> to the 490 year clock. Daniel's original prayer, by the way, these are answers to his prayer too was for the restoration of Jerusalem. That's what he's praying for. <clears throat> he's praying that it would be so. You remember that Jerusalem and the temple were destroyed by the Babylonians, as we already said, 586 BC. It was left a barren and unwalled city. And most, any successful and lasting city in these ancient times was a walled city. So it's a shadow of its former self. Gabriel comes to answer his prayer, to the specifics of it regarding his people in Jerusalem. And he informs him of this 490 year period that from, it begins from the going forth of the command. The command to rebuild Jerusalem begins God's prophetic clock upon uh, the nation of Israel, upon, upon the city of Jerusalem and the temple. The command according to Gabriel is qualified by three items, the street, the wall, and troublesome times. He says the street shall be built again and the wall. And man, that we can read all about that in the book of Nehemiah. These commands, these qualifiers are important because they separate two other commands involving uh, the rebuilding of the temple, but not the rebuilding of the city. Cyrus, the king of Persia, commands the temple to be rebuilt and allows the Jews to return in 539 BC. Artaxerxes, king of Persia, gives Ezra the priest a letter permitting and encouraging temple worship and sacrifice at Mount Moriah, but not 
the rebuilding of the city and the walls itself uh, in 458 BC. Daniel's prayer took place in the first year of Darius, about 539 to 538 BC, and Jerusalem was in complete ruins without walls and uh, neither a temple. The clock begins with the command regarding Jerusalem's reconstruction, specifically the walls and the streets. Uh, the command actually comes 93 years later. In the book of Nehemiah, we have a record of this command. Nehemiah was the cupbearer to the Persian king Artaxerxes. Nehemiah shared Daniel's concern. Many of the captives did. Many of those who were in faraway places and destroyed. He, he shared the concern for the state of Jerusalem 94 years after Daniel's prayer. His prayer was for the restoration of his people's city and the temple was rebuilt in 516 BC. But the, many Jews had very little incentive to return to an unwalled city with little protection. So Nehemiah prayed for the city to be restored fully. The king, seeing Artaxerxes, seeing Nehemiah's sadness, asked him why he looked so sad. Nehemiah told him, and Artaxerxes granted his request and gave Nehemiah orders to rebuild the city gates and walls. And it came to pass, according to Nehemiah chapter 2, in the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of Artaxerxes the king, the wine was before him, and I took up the wine and gave it to the king, and I had not been uh, before time sad in his presence. He'd never been sad in his presence before. And I said unto the king, if it please the king, if thy servant have found favor in thy sight, that thou wouldest send me unto Judah, unto the city of my father's sepulcher, that I may build it. And a letter unto Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me timber to make beams for the gates of the palace, which appertain to the house and for the wall of the city, and for the house that I shall enter into. And the king granted me according to the good hand of my God upon me. The order was given. Historically, we know this. The order was given in March or April of 444 B.C. from Artaxerxes for Nehemiah to build the wall. He gave him papers. The reign of Artaxerxes began in 464 B.C., so 20, his 20th year would have been 444 B.C. The month Nisan in, uh, is the first year of the Jewish calendar equivalent to March or April. Therefore, we can maybe guess if it's an exact time frame that Christ was crucified in March or April. God's clock began to tick with a command by the king of Persia. The timeline, I put a break here. We're gonna quit here. We're gonna pick up right there, timeline to Messiah the Prince. And I know that's a lot of stuff and that's a lot of notes. That's a lot of explanation, but what do we derive from this? I believe we're living in the last of the very last days and that we are on borrowed time and that yet a little while and he that shall come will come and he will not tarry. You don't want to be a part of that tribulation, period. You know, let him that is on the housetop not come down and get anything out of the house, Jesus said. Flee uh, from Jerusalem. Let's stand together tonight. We're going to pray and be dismissed. I've worked up a sweat going.